America, and there will be a table with salt on it in these little shakers, and it's free. The restaurant doesn't make you pay any extra for the salt. It, it's, it's free. I mean, you go to a Mexican restaurant, you get the chips and the salsa, but you go to McDonald's, and you can get a little packet of salt that then you can break open, and sometimes they even have the shakers out and the breakfast. But salt is just, we don't understand the value of it because it's so much everywhere. But one other thing you don't get is that we in our lives already feel really valuable. I mean, even if you've got a low self-esteem, if you live in North America, you feel really valuable in many respects. See, in our society, you're not a slave. No matter how much your boss makes you feel like one, you aren't a slave. In our society, whether you're a man or a woman, you have the same level of status. Now, granted, there's still some areas of the world where it seems like there may be some inequity in certain facets of that relationship, but nonetheless, everyone agrees that men and women are equally valuable. And, and if you're African-American, if you're Asian-American, if you're, if you're anything else, you're American. And we live in a society where you don't have segregation pushed down from the top on us. Our own prejudices might still remain, but it's not something that's pressured down onto you. We live in a society where we have so much freedom and so much self-worth that it's hard for us to even be impressed by the phrase, you are salt. Not so for the people who heard Jesus when he originally brought up the idea. Because Jesus is the first person to say this, and he said it to a bunch of people who are losers. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, we read this phrase. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. I printed that on your note sheet, but you need to go there in your Bible anyway because you got to see the context of Matthew chapter 5. If you're using the Bibles that we pass out here, it's on page 671. So just go there real quick with me. And you get to Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are people, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. There's a little heading there in our NIV. Scratch those out because they weren't in the original text. Jesus, when, when he was talking, he didn't stop there at the end of that phrase, persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, now I'm in a different section. Just so you all know, I'm in a different section. You're the salt of the earth. No, he's just talking. So what comes before salt of the earth is what informs salt of the earth. And we need to understand who Jesus was looking at. He was looking at a bunch of people who were standing around him. Why? Because they weren't working during the day. This is the middle of the day. Jesus is talking to people. How did all these people get there? Did they go there on their lunch break? I don't know. Did they not have a job? I don't know. There are only two categories of people who don't work. People who are too rich and people who are too poor. And Jesus didn't really gather crowds of people who were too rich. He was looking around and there were people there who were carpenters who didn't have a job to do that day. And there were people who were, there were people there who were just day laborers. And they didn't have any place to go. People who would work in a vineyard and they didn't have anything to pick that day. Farmers who were just waiting for their grounds to hopefully produce something. Jesus was looking at a bunch of Jewish people under a Roman government 
that was oppressive to them. And all those people, all those people were thinking about themselves that they were worthless. And so Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Being poor in your soul means that you don't have much of your spiritual life to show for anything. You feel empty inside. That's nothing to be proud of, right? We want people who are spiritually full. We want people who are spiritually strong, not those people who are spiritually weak. And yet Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Or blessed are those who mourn. We don't want people who who are mourning. They're not valuable. They're not important. No, Jesus says they're blessed. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are the peacemakers. No, it's warriors we want. See, Jesus looks at these people and he takes all the things that they would say about themselves make them worthless. And he says, that's what makes you great. And then he says, you're salt, which for them was the most valuable commodity they knew. More valuable than gold. Because if you're going to pay your soldiers of your country with something, you want to make sure they're well taken care of. And they got salt. And Jesus says to these people, you're salt. How, how does that work? How is that possible that these people are absolutely at the lowest rung of society and yet Jesus could place them at the highest rung of society and say, you're salt? How is that possible? It's because Jesus is looking at them and he's saying these words to them. It's not because of your social status. It's not because of your level of influence. It's not because of your skill set. It's not because of your talent. It's not because of your brain power. It's not because of your behaviors. It's not because of what you did yesterday or what you did the day before. It's because you're sitting here listening to me that I can tell you your salt. Jesus is teaching them a new way of viewing the world. He's teaching them a series of, of understandings, worldviews, lessons about how to see the way God made this world and your place in it. And if you continue reading, this is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he goes through and he begins to tell all kinds of moral guidelines, not the least of which is do to others what you would have them do to you. By hearing his words, they become salt. That's what he's saying to them. I got to just let you know a little bit about how they got salt in the ancient world. See, we go to the store and we buy salt. You know, they didn't do that. What they did to get salt is that they didn't have the equipment to take seawater and just turn it into salt. So what they needed to do is they would go up to the seashore and find the dirt that was next to the seashore that had dried a little bit and some of the salt was left in the dirt. And so they would scoop up the dirt or the rocks or the plants, whatever they could get around the seashore that had been soaking in the water. And then that is what they used for salt. So you would take those rocks, those dirt, those piles of dirt, or sometimes the reeds that you would take out of the lake or sea, whatever was salty. You would take those things home with you, and then you would take the plant and you'd rub the plant on your meat. Or you'd take the dirt and you'd rub the dirt on your meat. And hope that the dirt didn't have more bacteria in it than the meat already had on its own. They didn't know about bacteria, so it doesn't really matter. But you'd rub that stuff right on the meat. Or you'd take the rock that was soaked in salt and you'd scrape that all over your meat. And eventually those things would lose their saltiness. And you would take those reeds that you had pulled out of the river, lake, or whatever that was salty. And you would take those reeds that now no longer were, were salty. And you'd put them on the roof of your house to thatch it. And people would go up there and that's where they had their decks. That's where they had their little porches and they would hang out up there and trample on those reeds. Because it wasn't the salt that became unsalty. It was the thing containing the salt that became unsalty. And what you need to realize is Jesus is there standing in front of these people and he's saying, listen, you're soaking in it right now. You're right next to me. I'm teaching you. You're soaking it up right now. That makes You salt. If you soak it up, then you're salt. Salty doesn't have anything to do with who you think you are. 
or what you can do or your behaviors or the things you've done. It's about who you really are because of what's been put in you. Let me ask you to write this down. This is a key line that shapes everything today. Those who follow Jesus are the world's greatest blessing. Those who follow Jesus are the world's greatest blessing. I wrestled with this a lot. This whole week I had a different phrase for this because if you look at Jesus' words here, he doesn't say you're a salt. He says you're the salt. The only salt. And therefore, if salt is this great blessing, all week long I was thinking about toying with using this phrase where Jesus' followers are the only source of blessing for the world. And in some respects, I believe that's true, but I didn't want to just say that right here without proving it, without demonstrating it. And so I want to move into proof with you. See, I know you, you, you're at the low rung of your totem pole in your job. Okay, there are people over you and they don't seem to respect you. Maybe you actually have a relatively significant position at your job, but there's still other people over you, and they've got influence, and maybe you don't. Maybe in your family, no one ever pays attention to you. Maybe you you try to get your point across, but all you get is arguments and and anger in return. And you're, you're asking this question, how can I be a source of blessing in that kind of environment? No one's letting me speak. No one's letting me lead. No one's letting me do my thing. How can I be a source of blessing? And Jesus says, it's not what you do, it's what's in you that makes you salt. I have to prove this for you by kind of going through a little bit of history with you. And let's start with today. If if I were to say, you are the only blessing for the whole world, there's something inside most of us that would recoil against that. They would say, no, 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 that can't be true. One thing, of course, is insecurity. I don't feel good enough to be the source of blessing, the only source of blessing for the whole world. I don't, I don't feel good enough to be the world's greatest blessing. You know, I, I just don't feel good enough about myself. Well, sorry, you're way better than the people Jesus was talking to, and he said it to them, so therefore that excuse is out. So you're not allowed to keep that excuse anymore of saying that you don't feel good enough to be the world's greatest blessing, okay? So let's move on. The second thing is that we live in a society where we've been taught tolerance. We've been taught humility. We've been taught that everybody has a valuable contribution to make, and every group of people has a valuable contribution to make. And so therefore, we don't want to put ourselves on some type of pedestal and say, oh, us Christians, we're the world's greatest blessing. But we don't want to say that because there's other people 